friends and welcome to worship at Pemina Parish. I invite you to gather with me today in the sanctuary at Zion Calvin United Church in Darlingford on this Transfiguration Sunday. It is good for us to be together and I pray that our time of worship would bring you some measure of connection, connection with yourself, with God, with each other, and with our world. At the time of our recording, our announcements have not yet been finalized, so I invite you to pay very close attention to your news and notes this week or check out the church website. There will be announcements about Pancake Tuesday and Ash Wednesday, Lent at Home materials, and the Lenten uh, book study, so, and probably a whole lot more by the time we get to uh, getting news and notes together. So pay very close attention to your news and notes or check out the website. As we begin our worship service this morning, let us acknowledge the traditional territory upon which Pemina Parish gathers, for it is a gift and a responsibility. We give thanks to God for the creation of this land, and we acknowledge that we live in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, and the Dakota people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. May we learn to live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Each week we light our Christ candle as a reminder of God's presence with us, particularly through the person of Jesus. We also light our rainbow candle, which is for us a sign of God's abundant love for people of all sizes and shapes and abilities, gender identities and expressions, sexual orientations, races and ethnicities. All are part of the multi-hued rainbow that is God's vision for this world. We share that vision with one another by passing the peace, and we've been doing that using American Sign Language. And the sign for peace goes like this, be with, and this is a sign for you. That's the plural you. And the response, and also with you, goes like this. So it looks like this, and it's just between you and me. So today as we share the peace with one another, I invite you, if you have brown or hazel eyes, to share the piece first, and then if you have blue or green eyes, to do the response, and then we'll switch. So if you have brown or hazel eyes, and blue or green eyes, and then switch, blue or green eyes, and brown or hazel eyes. Now I invite you to turn to one of the windows in your home and offer the peace to our neighbors. We can't receive their response, but that should not stop us from offering the peace of Christ to our neighborhoods. I invite you now to call one another to worship with our call to worship that you can find in news and notes or in the description below the video. And today my partner Alicia and our daughter Anna Lee is going to join me to do the call to worship. So I will read the part of one, and Alicia and Annalie will do the part of many. Who is Jesus for us? The continuation of the covenant, the promise of something new, the presence of God's love. Who are we for him? The continuation of the covenant, the promise of something new, the presence of God's love. In God's love, he was changed.
transfigured and transformed in God's love, we are changed, given hope, made new. As people changed and changing, as disciples of Christ, as followers of Jesus' way, we worship God. Let's pray. Transforming God through your love, all creation is being transformed and made new. We cannot fully know the where's and when's and why's and how's, yet we witness your transforming power in Jesus and in our world, and in that witnessing we come to know, at least in part, the new things you are creating within and all around us. And so we pray to be changed, to be shaped, to be brought closer to your love and justice as we worship this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our gathering song is from More Voices United, number 44, Shadow and Substance. from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them were crossing on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. And if not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. 
and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Hi friends, I want to invite you to join me at our mountain for our story today. I've told you before that, well, I imagine that Jesus told stories around a campfire, but I know for sure that he's told stories while he was on the road and when he was in uh, grassy fields and when he was by rivers or lakes. And today our scripture text talked about Jesus and his disciples climbing a mountain. And that's where the story happened today. Jesus and his disciples went up the mountain, and when they got to the top of the mountain, suddenly Jesus changed. Something about him changed, and he was dazzling and sparkling, and he didn't look the way he had looked in the past. In the Bible, there are so many ways that people describe God or describe Jesus. They don't always look exactly the same way, and sometimes they just look different to different people. And so I really wanted to share a book with you today called Picturing God. And it's a story about lots of different ways that the Bible tells us that, that God might look to us. And I think it's a really great book, and has really cool art in it. It's written by Ruth Goring. Picturing God. God is the word. And that word is love. God is the light of the world that shines in every darkness, the beautiful darkness of night, the darkness of hiding when we are afraid, the deep darkness of being all alone. God shines there. When we don't know where to go, God's light shines on our path and leads us home. God is our sunshine, and we sprout like seeds open to the light and start to grow. God's living water rains down from heaven to water our thirsty hearts. God's love pours over us and never stops. Living water baptizes us, saying, you belong. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. We grow from God's vine. God's love flows through us like juicy sap. And then good things grow from us. Love and joy and peace like fat, mouth-watering grapes. God is the bread of life that feeds us and fills us up. It is God's own life given for us. The bread of life makes us strong. 
strong enough to share, strong enough to be kind, strong enough for pure delight. And we find new ways to give God's love away. God's goodness is like bright clothes that we can put on every morning with faith as a button and peace as the sleeves. When we are in danger, Jesus is the door that opens to give us shelter and closes to keep us safe. Jesus is also the good shepherd who knows your name and everyone else's too. When we journey into places that are slippery and scary, our shepherd stays close and never lets us go. Sometimes we must walk in hot, dry deserts. Then God is our rock, providing shade and a place to rest. God's spirit is wind, blowing away our fear and our mean words, blowing in cheerfulness and making us new. The spirit is our comforter, nearer than breath, teaching us what we need to know, wrapping us in love. God is a father who forgives again and again, who watches for us and runs to meet us. God is a mother who covers us with her wings. Jesus himself is the way we walk to God, who is our home. I love this book because it has so many ways for us to see God and the pictures in this book are amazing. If you ever want to borrow it from me, you're very welcome to borrow it. The pictures are beautiful. There are so many ways that we can come to know who God is. There are so many different ways that God can look to us. Next week, before we go, I want to pray with you, but next week we are starting the season of Lent and that's the 40 day journey toward Easter. And you're going to need some supplies for our time together. And we're going to meet with Jesus on the road each week. And you're going to need some paper and a pen or a marker and some scissors. Because we're going to be tracing our feet each week and cutting them out. So if you want, you can trace a whole bunch of feet ahead of time and get them ready. Or you can just trace the feet and cut them out as we meet each week towards Easter. All right? So let's pray before we go. God, you are so many things. You show up in so many ways as a vine, as bread, as light, as darkness, as water. You come to us in many forms. Help us to see you, to see you around us every day and know your love more deeply. Amen. I don't believe in ghosts as in spirits haunting us in the middle of the night. I'm not drawn to watching TV shows like Paranormal or Ghost Hunters. I do believe in the roundness of the earth and scientific evidence of climate change and evolution and disease transmission. But I also believe that there are some things in our world that cannot be explained, not now and maybe not ever. There are a lot of things we know and there is a lot that fits into the realm of mystery. When I read our scripture text for today, every inch of them seems filled with mystery and questions without answers. It can be a really fun experience, and you want to, might wanna try this, to pick up your Bible and to find the text that we're looking at and just ask every question that comes to mind. Our text from 2 Kings generated more questions than most for me. What does it mean that Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven in a whirlwind? What would that look like? How did all those prophets know that God was about to take Elijah away? 
How did Elisha know it? And how did he know that he should shush all those other prophets? Why did Elijah roll up his mantle or his cloak and then hit the water? And how did the parting of the water happen or did it? How does one share one's own spirit? And what about the chariot of fire and horses? What does a horse made of fire even look like? And then over 900 years later, we have the story of Jesus walking up a mountain with his disciples where he suddenly becomes all shiny. And then Elijah is there and Moses and they're chatting and then a cloud covers them and a voice says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And then Moses and Elijah are gone, they vanish. And it's like nothing ever happened. How and why? We could study these texts for decades, and many scholars have, and still be left with questions. Certainly the story of Elijah is meant to show us shades of the Exodus and paint him as kind of a, a Moses-like prophet. Certainly the story of Jesus is meant to show us shades of Elijah's departure into heaven. But even knowing historical context, like maybe the things like the fact that a mantle is a symbol of a prophet's power, or that the Greek custom at the time of Jesus was to build a shrine on the site of the epiphany of a deity, will not answer all our questions. We are still left with two miraculous occurrences that cannot be fully explained in a God whose purposes frequently confound us. And maybe that's a good thing. I do really appreciate learning about the context of scripture passages. It's part of what I love about biblical study, and in many cases, it really is crucial to our understanding of the text. But with some texts, we're also faced with the reality that there are aspects of God and God's activity that are outside of explanation or knowing. Not all things about God are knowable. A number of weeks ago, I talked about a pattern or a model for understanding the paths that we take in encountering God. And I promised that on Transfiguration Sunday, I would come back to that pattern. The diagram I talked about created by Urban Homes and later expanded on by Corrine Ware includes a horizontal axis and a vertical axis and a circle that encloses it all. So it's basically a circle divided in half both ways. And if you're likely to see this on your screen right now, and I included a copy of that diagram in news and notes if you wanna take a closer look at it later. Each of the quadrants in the circle represents a different spiritual type. And there's the word-centered and the listening-centered and the kingdom-centered and the emotion-centered. Each has particular practices and ways of knowing and encountering God. And the reason that we're enclosed all of these four types in a circle is to make it plain that each of the types is valued and present in our churches. And while all of us are likely to connect to each of the types at some point in our lives, we're usually more naturally drawn to one of them. The same is true for congregations and denominations and even entire faith traditions. Yes, entire faith traditions are drawn to kind of one side or the other of this spectrum. Let me tell you what I mean. The horizontal axis is the spectrum across, who, across which we say who God is. Last time I talked about this, I explained that one side of the spectrum is the cataphatic which says that God is knowable. And so we can do things to encounter God and we can say things about who God is. And this side of the spectrum includes both the word-centered and the emotion-centered types. It's firmly in this world, the knowable, explainable, and maybe even rational spaces. One might say the Western spaces when speaking of Christianity. The other side of the spectrum is the apophatic, which says that God is in fact mystery. The cataphatic says that God is knowable, while the apophatic side is not willing to make such bold claims. There's a sense that God is always more than we can possibly understand. Here we often describe what or who God is not, because it is so difficult to find words to adequately reveal who God is. Indeed, it is impossible. 
There's a phrase in the children's book, Old Turtle, that says it well. God is a twinkling and a shining far, far away. Because God is mystery and beyond description, prayer at this end of the spectrum looks more like listening and receiving, both from within and from around us in our surroundings. Rather than doing things like talking or reading or singing or acting, this way of engaging with God is not a passive retreat. It's not doing nothing, but simply a different way of engaging. Prayer here is more an act of emptying oneself in order to receive the mystery of God. For some, this may look like silence, centering prayer or meditation. For others, it might be about service, praying with their hands and feet. And while service is certainly an active thing, Service at this end of the spectrum usually grows out of contemplation on the kingdom of God and a desire to live as Jesus did, to embody Jesus. And that is the apophatic. The kingdom-centered types usually find ways to be valued by the word and heart-centered types since the kingdom-centered types are doing things. The listening-centered types often have a harder time in Western Christianity, where their contemplation or need for solitude may be seen as reclusive or lacking productivity. As I said earlier, whole traditions may find themselves on one end or the other of this spectrum, and churches in Western Christianity tend to find themselves on the cataphatic side, where God is knowable and we can do things to make encounter happen. We are always doing things. As opposed to Eastern Christianity or Eastern traditions generally, which tend to find themselves on the apophatic side where God is mystery and so we are invited to listen, to wait, to release expectations and receive. Both are valuable. And for far too long, the two sides have pushed against one another or stereotyped each other rather than acknowledging the beauty of the spectrum and the possibility for knowing God in many, many ways. While there are countless stories in the Jewish and Christian scriptures of God being made known to people in tangible ways through stone tablets or eating meals with Jesus, there are also stories that are mystery and many stories that are actually both. Elijah's journey into the heavens and Jesus' transfiguration sit pretty firmly in the realm of mystery. And we're left with mouths agape, just as the disciples must have been. Sometimes I imagine the scene and I see Jesus ready to head off down the mountain. All this has happened and Jesus is ready to just go back to everyday life. And I see him walking up to the disciples, but I hear in my mind Mary Poppins saying, Close your mouth, please, Peter. We are not a codfish. And then Jesus just walks away. I actually long for experiences like that where my mouth hangs open and I cannot understand. There's something transcendent, awe-inspiring, freeing even in those encounters where we are small and not in control, where God is more than we can ask or imagine. What I love about the apophatic way of knowing God is that it helps us to develop a posture of curiosity, of waiting to discover. If God is not fully and completely knowable and understandable, then there is endless possibility for learning and receiving. If God's creation is not fully and completely knowable and understandable, then we can keep searching and studying, but we can also just stand in awe. And if human beings as God's creation are not fully and completely knowable and understandable, then there is always more to a person than what I already know or already think that I know. And that is just so profoundly beautiful and important. Corrine Ware was right to place those axes in a circle because it's not either or. God is not either knowable or mystery, but fully both, always both. Infant born of Mary, washed in water, fed by milk and bread, and dazzling divine being on a mountaintop chatting with long dead prophets. 
This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the start of the season of Lent. And on Ash Wednesday, we are invited each year to acknowledge the reality of our mortality. But I think also the mystery that is humanity. We're invited to acknowledge that we are dust, but also that we've been created out of dust, that God does miraculous things with dust. And so I want to close my sermon today with one of my favorite Ash Wednesday poems from Jan Richardson called Blessing the Dust. I think it beautifully draws us into the known and the unknown, our human frailty and divine possibility. Blessing the Dust. All those days you felt like dust, like dirt, as if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial? Did you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what has made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes that makes its home inside the soil of the sacred earth. So let us be marked not for sorrow and let us be marked not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made and the stars that blaze in our bones and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge we bear. Amen. Our hymn is from Voices United, number 264, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. transformation. But some of us have more support systems and opportunities in, in place to help us get the new beginning that we need. Aria was in the third year of getting a law degree when she discovered she was pregnant. Without close family to lean on and limited financial resources, she had to take a break from school and go to work. To support herself and the child she was expecting, she took two jobs arriving at the first at six in the morning and finishing the second at 10.30 at night. 
I was on the unstable side of things, trying to find stable housing and later daycare. I just needed a start. I was on my own, she says. A social worker referred Aria to the Massey Center, an organization supported by your mission and service gifts that helps pregnant and parenting adolescents aged 13 through 25. At the Massey Center, Aria enrolled in maternity classes and motherhood programs. She received help getting her driver's license and found stable housing. As a young person, I was thrown into the world. I never had the start that I would have liked. I had to figure a lot of things out. The best part about being at the center is that I feel like I'm in a safe, supportive environment. I'm around other moms in the same situation. The staff are like family to me. They show up for you and that's important, she says. Aria is a proud mother of a happy, healthy 17 month old baby, baby boy named Amari. She's finishing the fourth year of her law degree and has important dreams. I want to be a good mom. I feel that I am a good mother, but I want a good job so I can support Amari and help other people. I had a rough start in life. That's why I'm studying law. I'm hoping to be of some use as a lawyer to benefit young people who went through things like I did, she says. Your gifts through mission and service give ambitious, intelligent young moms like Aria, as well as their beautiful children, the stability they need to thrive. And so we give as each is able out of our own generosity and discernment. Through our giving to our local congregation and to mission and service, we are able to share God's transforming love and give fresh starts to those who need them. You can give by mail or e-transfer or dropping a check off at the church or by PAR. From personal experience, PAR has been a great way for our household to set intentions for our monthly giving so that we're not just left scrambling or going, oh shoot, I meant to give and then just having forgotten. Setting up PAR is super simple. Just give Lori a call at the church office or send an email to office at PeminaParish.com. It's really very easy to set up. Please join me in blessing all of the gifts that have been given. God of grace and infinite transformation, we bring to you our gifts. Gifts of time, energy, prayers, talents, and money knowing that somehow you can make far more of them, them than what we, they seem on the surface. What may seem like just a few dollars can with your spirit and the work of your people become a new life. Bless the gifts that have been given and bless the givers as well. May we all be made new through your generous spirit. Amen. As I mentioned in my sermon, a more apophatic way of praying is through deep listening. Rather than letting our minds run like hamsters on a wheel, generating all the things we want to tell God or ask God about, we sit back and we listen. We allow the Spirit to bring our longings to mind and to our hearts. We wait for God's response. Writer Anne Lamott has a book in which she draws all she knows of prayer into three simple phrases help, thanks, and wow. Help, asking assistance from a higher power. Thanks, gratitude for all that we have and all that is good. And wow, awe at the beauty of the world around us. And that will be our prayer for today. I will simply say the word and invite you to rest in silence, waiting on the spirit to bring your prayers to mind. And today, rather than closing with the Lord's Prayer, I'll invite you to receive God's response in silence. Praying in silence can take practice for many of us. If the silence is uncomfortable or unfamiliar, try focusing on your breath. Just notice your breath. That is a great place to start with listening prayer. Let us pray together. Loving and compassionate God, help.
generous God, thanks. Creating God, wow. You have heard our prayers and God, we rest in you and receive your response, however it comes or whenever it comes. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the incarnate mystery. Amen. Our next hymn is from Voices United, 419, May the Grace of Christ. together. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the love of God flow over and all around you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.